Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Armstrong. I'm from Perth in Western Australia. I work for a company named Kinetic IT, who are a uh, managed service provider for a number of clients in all over Australia, actually. By managed service provider, I mean we, pro we provide infrastructure services, security, uh, service desk, process management, these sorts of uh, typical enterprise IT needs. And uh, myself, I work in the tools and automation team. So we look after programs like Zabbix and Puppet, uh, as well as service management, ITSM tools, and these sorts of things. Uh, you'll also see me uh, fairly frequently online as an open source contributor. Uh, I do have a few projects on GitHub, and I've also had the pleasure of contributing to, uh, to Zabbix. And if you want to find me on Twitter or on GitHub, my, uh, my handle is at CavalierCoder. So today, I'm hoping to give you a brief overview of the deployment that we have at the Department of Education in Western Australia, which is my primary client. Uh, and I'll also talk around uh, how we use automation and different tools that we've built to uh, make managing Zabbix uh, much easier and much more efficient and allow us to focus on things that we really want to do. So a little bit about the Department of Education. Uh, we have around 400,000 end users. Now this includes students and teachers and uh, administrative staff. And they're uh, distributed amongst about 800 schools over this massive uh, state, which is, happens to be about seven times larger than Germany. Um, Across the state, we have roughly 7,000 servers. 1,500 of those are at our central data center. Uh, and most of those servers are, are I say, uh, heterogeneous. They're, they're all completely different to each other, all serving different roles. Uh, and they kind of need to be managed as uh, discrete servers. While the rest of the servers, the other 5,500 out at the schools, uh, we have a standard operating environment. So we tend to have the same uh, configuration at each school. And that makes management uh, significantly, significantly better. Our Zabbix environment now monitors the whole lot. Uh, every server in our environment is monitored via Zabbix, uh, all 7,010 of them as of the time of this uh, screenshot. Uh, about one and a half million items, a half a million triggers, and a, and a modest 2,000 values per second. Uh, we, we tend to do most of our checks every five minutes, so that's why our values per second is, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's moderate. Um, we have... Uh, a single Zabbix server. So we have a physical Zabbix server uh, and a physical database PostgreSQL server, and we haven't needed to scale beyond that. We do separate out the web server into a separate virtual machine. Uh, and a little tip from us too is we have a second instance of the web server which is configured for uh, much greater memory usage and longer timeouts so that we can run batch operations for updating our templates. Some of our templates apply to about 5,000 hosts. So when we want to make a change, it can take time, can take a few minutes. Uh, so we have a separate PHP instance that's isolated from the end users and, uh, and we use that for our batch operations. So a little on the automation now and uh, mostly why it's important to us. With a product like Zabbix, what we want to spend our time doing, what I want the, the team and I to be uh, you know, investing in is improving the product, improving the monitoring coverage, improving the, the quality of the metrics that we're gathering, working with uh, with our business intelligence teams to you know, create better reports and better business insight uh, and better capacity planning for our IT infrastructure. What we don't want to do is spend our time adding and removing hosts, adding and removing users, uh, trying to keep dev, test and prod in sync, uh, you know, remediating issues that, that don't deliver any value. So why do we automate? We automate so we can spend time adding value. We get these mundane tasks out of the way and then we can focus on con continually improving the, the Zabbix monitoring solution. The first thing we automated was our build, uh, build pipeline. So we started with Vagrant and if you haven't heard of Vagrant, it's a, it's a great tool for your workstation. It lets you define a virtual machine as a text file. So you can say, I want to start with a, with a CentOS 7 base image, I want to configure certain network interfaces, uh, I want to run some post build scripts, and that text file can be distributed amongst your development team. And uh, it will build the same virtual machine for everyone on the team. So we use that to stump up our Zabbix environment on our personal workstations. And I've also used it to, um, to build the, uh, the Linux box that I'm going to use to demonstrate some of this stuff later today. So, for example, you could go onto GitHub, grab the same text file that I've used to build mine, and you could build the same machine at home. So once Vagrant's provisioned a virtual machine on our, on our development workstations, we use Puppet to install and configure Vagrant, uh, sorry, to install and configure Zabbix. 
as well as all of our custom tools uh, and all the dependencies and integrations that we have there. So we can then use that puppet code not only to build those Vagrant machines, but also to provision our development environment, our test and staging, and ultimately our production environment. So they're all built using the same code base. I don't have to worry about keeping them in sync. I don't have to worry about configuration drift. Uh, Puppet takes care of all of that for us. Because it's defined in code, we keep it in source control. So we can collaborate as a team and make sure we're not colliding, you know, conflicting with each other's changes. We can roll things back quickly. We can distribute things easily. We also have uh, quite a few custom packages. We do a fair bit of work on um, customizing the Zabbix server and front end and agent binaries. So we, uh, we use the, a similar process to package up those, those custom binaries. This is what our puppet code looks like. Uh, the first little part there is just installing Zabbix. The second part is configuring the Zabbix server configuration file. Uh, that's it's re reasonably simple. The, behind there, there's a little more implementation, but uh, Puppet abstracts most of that away for us. As I mentioned, uh, it's going to keep dev test and prod in sync, but the, the beauty of this process for us is that it all starts on a Vagrant machine on our dev box. So I can run our, our full production Zabbix environment on my laptop right here, make some changes. As Oleg said, you've got to test your changes, right? I can do that on my, my workstation and then progress that through to production. The other advantage of Puppet is, uh, and using this process, is that we can rebuild on a whim. So, and we have done this for previous versions of Zabbix upgrades. We simply shot the Zabbix server in the head uh, and started with a blank server and rebuilt it from, from scratch. In a matter of minutes, I should, I should emphasize, one, one touch. Uh, the other important part of this process is the testing, and, and we automate the, the testing of uh, everything that we expect from our Zabbix environment. So, we do this using, uh, initially we used Bamboo, now we're using Team City. And this will actually nightly spin up, it'll check out all of our source code from, from Git. It'll spin up a Vagrant box on a test machine somewhere. It'll install Puppet to our latest code changes. Uh, it'll install all the configurations and all the integrations. And it will then execute a bunch of uh, behavior driven design tests using Cucumber. So Cucumber is gonna test to make sure Zabbix can connect to the database, that the database is the correct version. Uh, that it can connect to the, AP, uh, the Zabbix API is working and connecting. Uh, it'll also test our entire build process to make sure at any point in time we can rebuild Zabbix without uh, anything going wrong. And it also tests our runtime configuration to make sure the templates we expect are there, uh, that we're gathering the data we expect. Uh, so I mentioned automating the, or not wanting to spend time adding hosts and removing hosts and users. We've got users coming in and out of the environment all the time. And we've got hosts coming in and out of the environment all the time. In the last year or so, uh, we've rolled in uh, an additional 2,000 servers to, to Zabbix as they've come into management. Uh, and if we had to do that by hand, we'd expect a lot of human error and we'd expect a lot of overhead. And I'd rather my staff spend time uh, working on adding value to Zabbix as we discussed. So user management and host management, we have scripts uh, that run in hourly cron jobs. And what these will do is they will source data from, for users from Active Directory and for hosts we have a, a CMDB which is hosted on uh, Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, and we will create views of the data that's in these systems inside the script, we'll, we'll execute a query, we'll get all the information that we need and then we'll query the Zabbix API uh, and then remediate any differences using the API. So starting with user management, um, the configuration file for our script, and unfortunately I can't share the script with you just yet, um, as it's, it's pretty dirty to tell you the truth. Um, the configuration file for our script is just a simple any file. Uh, and we define the Active Directory groups that we want to import from Active Directory and create and provision user groups and user accounts in Zabbix. So we start with a little group definition. Uh, we give it a, a name for the Zabbix group. We tell it the distinguished name of the, the group object in Active Directory. And for this particular group, we say we want to make them super admins. And then we have a similar group for our BI team. Uh, this will go and yeah, enumerate those groups in Active Directory, make sure those user accounts exist in Zabbix for all of those users, remove the ones that aren't meant to be there, and then roll them up into the correct group memberships. So yeah, as operations members come and leave the teams, uh, there's zero touch for us. We know within an hour of their Active Directory account being provisioned, they'll have a, an account in Zabbix with the correct permissions. And then uh, host management is a little more complicated. Um, but we have our CMDB, which has got all of our servers defined in there. Again, we, uh, we create a view or create a model of the data in the CMDB. 
And in this case, this is a different script, is going to uh, connect to a database uh, XML configuration file, this is, uh, and we're going to define a connection to a database. This is our CMDB. And for that connection, we're going to define different views. And we're going to say, this is a view of all of our data center servers, and there's an SQL query that sits behind it. Once we gather that view, the script expects certain things to be in that SQL query. So Zabbix is going to expect a default group. It's going to expect an IP address. It's going to expect a host name, et cetera. And uh, we make sure all that data is in the query. And then we also have arbitrary fields we can add, such as the operating system or the, the service category of the server. And then we can, from this information, we can build out, wrong button, we can build out uh, additional host groups. So we could use the OS field from the query and say, please create a host group, let's say it's Windows, called Windows Servers, and add that host to that. Uh, we do the same for templates, macros, and, uh, and host inventory. So pretty much at any point in time, or up to an hour, uh, our Zabbix configuration matches what's in our CMDB. So I'm going to attempt the impossible and try and give you a demonstration of something now. But uh, when it comes to generating SNMP templates, uh, they can be time consuming, uh, especially when you're looking at a new device and from a new vendor, and maybe uh, the MIB files have got thousands of items in it. And it can take a while to figure out what you want to see from that device, what, value, what data is valuable, uh, and uh, there's, there's, there's normally hundreds, right? So we need to start somewhere. So we've written a script to parse the, the MIB files that are provided by the vendors. The MIB files define an SNMP tree with all the items that are available for monitoring on their device, say it's a router or a switch or a UPS. Uh, and our script is going to generate a Zabbix template XML document from those MIB files. So let's, let's give this a crack. Uh, this script is available for you on GitHub. And hopefully is of value to you as well. So I'll start by um, just showing you the SNMP data that's available on, uh, on this Vagrant box that I've got here. So we'll do an SNMP walk. Um, the community string will be public. We're going to use version 2C. Uh, and I'll just get everything that's available. Nope, what have I missed? Localhost. So this is all the data that's published by the SNMP daemon on a, on a Linux box. That's, and it's, it's too much. We don't know where to start to look. So I've got a, uh, if I can find my mouse cursor, we'll start with a portion of the tree called um, the interface MIB. Excuse me for just a moment. Copying and paste is difficult on Windows, it seems. So let's go back to this window. Let's do the same thing again, but we will uh, use the IF MIB portion of the MIB tree, which is where uh, SNMP will define all the, interf uh, the network interfaces on a machine and all the metrics that are available. So if we run that, we'll see, uh, hey, cool, I can see the screen down here. That makes things easier. Um, we're going to see different metrics available for each network interface that's on the machine. So uh, at the top, we will see the interface descriptions. So loopback, Ethernet 0, and Ethernet 1. This is available from the daemon. And then for each interface, we see uh, the administrative status, whether it's up or down, as well as the packets coming in, packets coming out. And we want to capture this information in Zabbix. So that can be, if we're going to build it by hand, I hope you can imagine it's going to take a fair bit of time. But we're going to change, change everything today. It's going to blow your mind. Oh, I'm serious. Uh, so let's run MIB to Zabbix. What I'm going to do here is tell it to enable all items, because by default it doesn't, because you could have 6,000 odd items in there. The other thing I'm going to do is tell it to uh, do a 60 second discovery delay. By default it'll do one hour, but unless anyone here wants to wait roughly that long, let's, let's get on with it. And then uh, I'm going to ask it to do the OID for interface MIB. What have we missed? A, a hyphen. There we go. 
one XML document. So let's pipe that somewhere useful. Cool, that's not a useful place. Let's put it where I can access it. Vagrant, boom. Okay, cool. Now all these uh, errors here you can ignore. That's actually the uh, SNMP library trying to pass all the MIB files on the, on the machine that are provided by the vendors and unfortunately they have parsing errors in them. So we don't need to worry about that. Now we'll jump into this great product called Savix. And we will, how can I get a better view here? Maybe I can't. Let's go into templates. Let us import. And I think that's the one there. Cool. Interfaces, let's import that. And it worked. So we'll come over to our Zabbix server. And as you can see, it's got no items or anything on it at the moment. We'll add that template. And while that's uh, going off and doing some discoveries and such things, I'll show you what's involved. So for the interface MIB, it's, a, it's an SNMP table uh, and there's an entry in that table for each interface. So there's no uh, singleton items. There's no items that appear as standard items in the Zavix template. Everything is a discovery rule in this case. So if we have a look at the discovery rule, we'll see that it's going to do an interface discovery. There's 22 prototypes. It's got an arbitrary uh, key name. And as we requested the one minute interval, you can see that showed up there. If we look at the prototypes, oh, actually, excuse me, before we do that, let's have a look at the actual key. So the Zabbix V3 introduced a uh, smarter low-level discovery of SNMP, allowing us to use uh, values from the table to create a, a useful label of our discovered items. So in this case, um, the script does some best guessing. So for an interface table, there's a key called interface description, and the script guesses that the description field is the best way to de describe your, uh, your keys. So it uses that as the primary SNMP value. Uh, all the other columns that are in that database are then appended there as, as uh, discovery macros for you as well. Unfortunately, there's a 256 character limit uh, on that field, so we can't import all of those uh, macros, but the script will, uh, will break before it gets to 256 and it just um, drops the rest. So, what else have we got in here? Uh, oh, and it brings in the description from the MIB file. So if the vendor provides any documentation for each uh, item, that, that'll show up in your discovery rules and your prototypes and in your items in Zabbix as well. That can be helpful. So let's have a look then at our latest data and hopefully we'll see some really useful stuff. There we go. So the, for each interface, we can see them here. There's the administrative status for the loopback, Ethernet 0, Ethernet 1, much like we saw on the SNMP walk earlier. And you'll see as well that the template generator has created a value map in Zabbix to say if it's a 1, then the MIB file says it's up. If it's a 0, then it should be down, and those values are there. Uh, it'll also do some smarts around uh, bytes per second, uh, you know, uh, the delta speed changes, it'll, it'll make sure those uh, data types are set correctly in Zabbix and they should appear in a second as well. But we'll skip through those. So this is gonna build a rather large template for you. It's gonna be using the information from the vendor's MIB file. It's probably not a good idea to put these templates into production. What it is a good idea is to use them as a starting place to quickly see the data that's available, quickly surface it in Zabbix, and then either tune the template from there or simply uh, create a new template and import the, the things that are important to you. Let's get back to PowerPoint. All right, so along those uh, lines, we did a similar thing with Windows performance counters. And in case you're not familiar with those, performance counters and Windows are organized into groups or counter sets. Some of those counter sets are singletons. You know, we, we can get the, um, 
the number of processes or the number of threads on a machine, and some of those uh, support discovery or their multi-instance, such as uh, the processor or logical disk or physical disk. Uh, so for each instance of that counter set, we will see multiple available counters, such as CPU time, idle time, user time, etc. If you'd like, I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of how this one works as well. So we'll start with a PowerShell window. How many windows guys do we have in the room, if I may? Predominantly windows. Yeah, I'm with you guys, by the way. I, like, I, I use windows a lot, so please don't be too embarrassed. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's unusual for a conference I've, I've attended, I suppose. Um, let's start with, the, in, maybe in Australia, everyone's scared of Linux. Europeans, know, they, know, they know what they're doing, right? So Let's go export counter set to Zabbix. Template. Cool. And I'm going to ask it to not use active checks so that we don't have to wait for the, the agent to refresh its config. I'm also going to set the discovery delay again to be 60 seconds. And I'm going to ask it to give me a couple of counter sets. I'm going to ask it for the processor counter set, which is going to get me idle time, processor time, etc. And I'm going to ask for the system counter set, which includes uh, context switching, thread counts, processor counts, uh, queue lengths, etc. And that's going to spit out a great big XML document. Cool, useless. Let's pipe it somewhere. And I'm going to out that to, let's call it pdh.xml. And I'm going to remember where I am. Yep, cool. Let's drop back into Zabbix. Templates, import. And I'm going to apply this to the agent that's monitoring my, my laptop here running Windows 10. So. How am I doing for time? Is there a timer anywhere? Cool. So that's going to start monitoring. Uh, while it does that, I'm going to show you once again what it's done. So we've got two applications here. One will be system, one will be processor. We've got a bunch of items. Now remember, system was a singleton. It wasn't a multi-instance counter, so there's no discovery rules invo involved there. So we should see all of our system-based performance counters here. Uh, you know, number of processors, processor queue length, etc. cetera. Huh. No. No. Cool. Let us uh, have a look at that discovery rule. Now, important point here, if you're going to install this module and, and use it yourself, the performance counter dot discovery key does not exist in the Windows agent. There is a, uh, a feature request and a patch available for it, uh, but I also, inside this uh, PowerShell module, provide the commands you need to do it with a, with a user parameter. My, my Zabbix agent here on this Windows box is configured with the user parameter to call out to PowerShell and, uh, and get the, the discovery information. One minute like we asked for. I hate this trackpad. It jumps around on me without being asked. Uh, here we go. Yeah, so these are all the prototypes for that discovery rule. And for each processor, we're going to expand the, the instance macro. And we're going to see you know, interrupt time, privilege time, processor time, etc. And these are all using the built-in uh, performance counter. So let's jump over to latest data. And we should see for our Windows machine. Huzzah, we have data. There's all the system information that we requested. And we'll also see no processes yet. Let's give it a minute. You know, I practiced this many times to make sure it wouldn't go wrong. So just, you just got to believe me that processes will, will show up here. It's not supported. Now we're testing whether I know to look in the right place. C 
So, discovery rules. Not supported. I broke my agent somehow between now and not touching it. So anyway, they will show up. Uh, lodge a... Uh, I'm going to go lodge a, uh, an issue on GitHub right now. So if you can wait for me to do that, no. So what that's going to do is um, it's going to call out to a, a PowerShell commandlet called get counter set instances, which, are, which we wrote in the module, uh, and I'm going to say processor. And it's going to spit out each available processor on this machine. Does that mean 10 minutes? Cool. Um, and then I'm going to pipe that into a command which we created called convert to Zabbix discovery. And it's going to turn it into a nice little JSON document. We pipe one into the other, and we can use that within our discovery rules in Zabbix. And the last thing I'd like to show you today in terms of uh, some of our things we're automating for our processes would be uh, an agent stress test. So as I mentioned before, we do a lot of um, custom code within the Windows and the Linux agent, as well as writing modules and uh, user parameters and scripts, et cetera, that we, that we distribute out to all of our nodes. It's really important to us to know that, uh, that these things aren't going to have memory leaks, file handle leaks, that they're not going to impact the performance of those machines in any negative way for disk I.O. or perform, uh, CPU utilization. So what we do is we, we have a stress test that um, is going to go and just hammer the agent with thousands of requests per second, uh, and, and it's going to expose any memory leaks and these sorts of things. So why bother with modules? Uh, I'm going to take you back to Gleb's talk, and he said, yes, they are harder to, they are harder to write, to write in C and use the GNU uh, build system. It takes a little extra fiddling, but I promise you it is worth it. Uh, and besides, learning these sorts of things is, is the essence of life and is part of the joy of being a, a sysadmin. So, uh, and as a bonus, you're also going to get better performance and uh, you're going to get a simpler packaging and redeployment of, of, those, um, of those modules. For example, if you wanted to use a Perl or Python script to push out with your agents, you're going to have to make sure you've got the right version of the interpreter, the right version of all the libraries, et cetera, out there. And you're going to want to make sure that those versions that you're distributing for your Zabbix scripts don't conflict with the applications that are already on those servers that require different versions. So nightmare. Uh, C modules solve that mostly. They still have some dependencies, but it's a big difference. Uh, so a brief demonstration, just a minute or two, of the stress test that is available to you. Here's this guy again. Cool. So Zabbix agent bench. By default, this tool is going to query the Zabbix agent on the local machine. So I'm going to say key agent.ping. And it's just going to, using one thread in this case, it's going to hammer the agent with as many uh, requests sequentially as it can handle. And if I hit Control C to cancel it, we're going to see that we got uh, roughly 1,200 new values per second in the bottom right there. So that's using a built in key. If we were to, for example, use uh, anything that forks, so in this case, we'll do a system.run. Uh, I'm going to need some sort of quotes here. I'm going to say bin echo one. This is you know, just calling a single uh, binary, doing one fork. It's not loading up any uh, run times at the moment. And we're going to see a significant drop in performance. So it's only about 700 values per second there. If we were to, say, use uh, a tool like Python, which is going to load up its runtime, it's going to load up its parser, it's going to load up all of the modules, and then we're going to simply just call print one. We're going to see another, another degradation as well. So uh, it's important to note here that you probably don't need to hit 600 items per second on your, on your agent. In that case, we've got 86 values per second. That's more than you need for monitoring, but consider if you're using scripts to do things like database monitoring where you potentially have hundreds or thousands of items that have been queried every 60, to five, 60 seconds to five minutes, uh, the, the impact on the machine can add up, and you can add latency and delays to your, to your monitoring. So we like to avoid that. Uh, for fun, let's, let's do this against my Windows machine using a PowerShell script. So would anyone hazard a guess at how many values per second we might get if I just ask the Windows box to spawn PowerShell and execute print one? I mean, we got 80 per second on Python. 10? Cool. 10's a, 10's a good guess. Probably should have started it before I asked that question. 
Let's just wait a second now. Uh, and it's not going to be anywhere near 10, actually. It's, whoops. Errors? They all broke. Something's wrong with my Zabbix agent. Let's give her a restart. Maybe that's why it was playing up before. In the... Uh, this, is, uh, this is written in Go using the Go command line, so it expects a single hyphen. Is that... No, that? Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Bam. Okay. So I'd actually expect this to get around one or two uh, values per second. On a low performance agent, of course, you'll get better performance on a, uh, a full-fledged server, but in this case, less than one value per second. So you don't want to be executing PowerShell scripts from your, from your Zabbix agent more than once a second. Uh, unless you've got a, a beefier box. What I didn't show you there is as well, those PowerShell instances take up between 60 and 100 meg. So we used to do a lot of SQL server monitoring with PowerShell, and we've since tried to move away to more uh, you know, native code. So PowerShell is getting much, much better over time. All right, what's next? Actually, that's all for me. So I'm going to publish these slides, or, or Zabbix will publish these slides, and I've included here some uh, references for these projects. If you want to have a look at the template creators, if you want to have a look at this agent bench test, I've also included my uh, PostgreSQL module there and our um, Wix template for creating MSI packages on Windows. Uh, so please help yourself to those later. For now, uh, I'd welcome any questions. And if I can't answer your questions now, please approach me later, um, or you can tweet me or talk to me on GitHub at Cavalier Coder. So, thanks. Thank you. So, do we have time for questions? Yes. Please. Yeah. Cool. Do you have any questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for the excellent presentation. Uh, we are running the uh, deployment of Zabbix, which is very close to what you have demonstrated. Uh, at the same time, we have automated the uh, from CMDB to uh, to Zabbix provisioning, etc. Uh, in the initial uh, segment, you talked about having two web uh, servers and uh, like capacity planning. Mm. So, can you please uh, uh, throw some light on the capacity planning, if possible? Yeah, uh, I, th I think in an immature uh, monitoring in, uh, solution, which is where we started, we, we very much just look at event management. We very much just look at is, is it up, is it down, is it re responding to requests, and we generate incidents when it goes wrong. I think that's a great place to start. Um, the next level of maturity for me is when you can um, start using the data that you're capturing to make decisions about funding for IT and make decisions about systems design. So we might have a question, uh, for example, someone might say, hey, we need 10 brand new virtual um, hosts. We need a new ESX cluster. Um, if we were to guess whether we actually needed it, whether we needed that capacity or whether we could optimize the capacity we've got, we, don't, we didn't have good data to support that kind of decision making. So now we monitor things such as or aggregated CPU usage across the environment or uh, memory usage on those machines. And we can actually put data in front of the business and say, you should fund this or you should not fund this because we legitimately need this. So, um, Yeah, it's, I think it's about providing good reports month to month on how we're tracking with our utilisation of the infrastructure as well as uh, allowing for better decision making. Any other questions? Hey. Uh, to clarify on the template uh, builder for SNMP the generator, uh, it actually walks a live SNMP instance instead of parsing a standalone MIB file, right? Uh, no, it, it parses the MIB file. Okay, so but it, the parameters that you specify for the port, for the SNMP version 3 authentication, what, what, where are those used? Uh, so those are passed through to the template. So the template configuration is going to decide whether it needs to, well, for each item, whether those items should be version 2, version 3. If you're using SNMP authentication, all of that's configurable from the, uh, from the MIB to Zabbix script. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh,
Hi, great presentation. Um, how do you measure the value that is agent collecting and all the way it shows up in the, in the GUI? The time it takes from the collection to show up in the GUI, do you measure that time? Uh, no, I can't say we do. Um, do, you, do you know how we can measure that? Uh, so until the time it shows up in the GUI, I guess there's, there's a few predictable things that happen between the time the data is collected and it goes into the GUI. Um, we do measure the, the backlog on the history sinker. So we do have a look at the history to sinker to see how quickly it's flushing data through to the database. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but once it's in the database, it should appear in the GUI as soon as the GUI refreshes. So uh, we measure that, but not, not specifically how long it takes to show up. Right, the deployment size that you have 7,000, I'm assuming you have the separate components, like the web interface is separate, database is running on separate box and there may be some network latencies or something. Yep. So from, from that perspective, it, it does show up in the GUI, but if there is a network latency, oh, sure. it doesn't. So yeah, it's so we definitely monitor, so we monitor on a component level. We do monitor uh, the network latency and also the query latency to the database. Uh, we also monitor the database quite comprehensively. Um, uh, but yeah, we just don't measure, we don't have a specific metric to say how long between uh, an item being captured and that same item appearing in the, in the front end. Okay. Yeah. But we certainly make sure we optimise and monitor to, to minimise that time. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? I have one if I can ask. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so how many Zabbix servers do you use? I didn't get it. One or a lot? We have, we have one Zabbix server, uh, so that we don't have a HA set up at the moment or a distributed setup. So that was the question. You don't have any HA? No. Um, I suppose when we went for funding for the Zabbix project initially, it was a sort of a proof of concept. We were trying out. We'd never gone with open source before for a, um, enterprise monitoring. So there wasn't much appetite to spend the extra for, for high availability. And given the Department of Education are sort of not, it's, it's not a um, life or death critical kind of organization. So out, downtime is not really, a, a, it's definitely a concern, but it's not, it's not worth the investment for them. That said, HA is certainly best practice and I think we should do it and we will do it. Uh, but we just, we've had more important things to focus on, I suppose. And the database size, how do you handle it? The de sorry? The size of the database, how do you, how do you uh, avoid the huge database growth? Yeah, uh, we use uh, PostgreSQL partitioning. Nice. We've, we've got scripts in Postgres and we use multi-tiered storage. So we have local SSD on our Postgres server uh, and it will, I think it's roughly 800 gig and we partition by day and month for different tables and then we ship older tables off to SAN for, for second tier storage and then we have a slow, tan, a slow SAN for archival data. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>